I'd like to start by thanking you for being here because it's week six and you've lots of other things that you could be doing in your lunchtime. Uh, and uh, and um, both myself and the teaching and learning unit uh, appreciate that time and commitment. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank Bill for inviting me down here and for organising it here and obviously to Vivian for sponsoring the coffees and sandwiches and stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that you all think that motivation is important, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So, so this, is, this, is, this is the slide that, we were, that I was interested in, which is, um, I guess, your own thoughts on what motivates our students or your students. Success, reward. Success and reward, yeah. The exam. Yeah. The exam, What's absolutely. going to come up in the exam? What's going to come up, yeah. Are there other things that can motivate our students? Feedback and praise. Feedback and praise is very important. Yeah. What's interest me? Interest, yeah. Yeah. Quite a clear interest in the subject now. Yes. Relevance to yeah. their job. Relevance is a big one. So, like, we'll talk about this um, notion later on, uh, or we'll explore it more, I, I guess, fully. But there is two sides, if you like, to motivation, what the literature would call intrinsic motivation, which is that notion about intrin, uh, and address that by making sure that what we talk about is relevant to them and stuff like that. And the other side of it then they call the extrin extrinsic motivation, which is about assessment and rewards and those types of things. Um, and there's a, they, have diff they, they work in different ways. And... Um, extrinsic motivation is can be very powerful but is also very limited. So as an example, I have a nine-year-old who has um, spelling tests every Friday and invariably gets loads and loads of them wrong. Uh, so last year um, I started giving her a fiver every Friday if she got all her spellings right and for every spelling she got wrong she lost a euro. Okay? Um, it worked really, really well. Okay, she got them all right. There was, there was no problem. Like, she has plenty of ability, just has no interest in actually getting them right. It's not something that she thinks is terribly important and stuff like that. So she doesn't really try very hard when the, on the day of the test. So you give her, give her a fiver, tell her she's going to lose a euro, gets them all right. I stop doing that, and she stops trying. Do you know, so there is no long-term gain if we just use extrinsic factors all the time. So, like, once the assessment is finished, you know, if we're using assessment as the primary means to motivate our students, once that stops or once that finishes, then there isn't anything, or there may be very little for them to, to work with in terms of motivation, and then you see motivation dropping and, and all that sort of stuff. So, 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 so I guess one of the things we're trying to, to look at here is alternatives to the use of assessment or the external factors, because... Um, they, they have limited um, uh, they, they have limited abilities I guess or limited um. so, the, so the sorts of things that, that I'm hoping we'll be able to do is describe how motivation um, impacts academic achievement to identify some attributes of motivation that we, uh, that, can, that we can influence during lectures and to think about strategy so that afterwards you might be able to think about some of these things and how they might apply to your own teaching. And I'm not suggesting that all of them are going to apply. Like the trouble with teaching is it's very context dependent. So you have to think about the suggestions in the context of your own subjects, in the context of your own learners, and, and you know, does this make sense? Is this likely to work for, for me? Um, in terms of, I guess, the, the title Successful Lecturing, where I'm coming from is that I would be uh, I would regard as a lecture successful if during that lecture su students learn something. Uh, and I do mean in that kind of 50 minute or that hour period that they're engaged, that they're interested, that they're learning, as opposed to any tours or any of those things. So for it to be successful during that period, they should learn something. Um, and I would go further and say that they should learn something. Like there's loads of resources out there on online and textbooks and that sort of stuff. And really, a successful lecture should do more than those resources, okay? Because otherwise, why not just give them the resources and let them read those and learn from those? So that the lecture should maybe in some ways 
go to illustrate how we think about um, a particular discipline, about integrating different things that are very difficult to do in, in, the, uh, uh, in general. And stuff. I should say, too, as I'm going through this, if you have particular opinions or thoughts or questions, please feel free to interrupt and, and ask. Um, so, um, as a particular example, and this is just only one example, which is looking at the question, does motivation matter? Um, uh, it's the 2012 resources, uh, and they were looking at it, I think it was in Singapore, it was a study done with a couple of thousand students there, where um, they tried to look at the links between, um, here on the bottom right-hand corner, academic achievement, i.e. Um, grades in exams predominantly, and up here on the top uh, left-hand side, motivation. Um, and what this study showed and what most similar studies um, have shown is that there aren't direct links between motivation and performance in exams, but there are very strong indirect links between motivation and the types of learning strategies that students choose. So motivation, what, what we understand is that motivation impacts the type of learning strategy, strategies that students choose, which then obviously impacts, sorry, impacts on um, academic achievement. Um, and the numbers there represent the relative strengths of those relationships, so they're on a scale of 0 to 1. So the 0.64, for example, is suggesting there's very strong links between motivation and um, learning strategies. So in terms of motivation, the sorts of things that they would have suggested that are the sorts of things that we know that motivation does. Um, students that are motivated are more likely to pay attention to what you're talking about and are less easily distracted. Um, uh, one of the big things that motivation does is when students encounter difficulties within you know, a, a class or within a problem, those that are more motivated are likely to persist. They're going to continue on and have another go at it and see if they can solve it and stuff like that. So in terms of a learning strategy, persistence is really important when we encounter difficulties within a program and motivated students are much more likely to persist. Um, and, likely, and also motivated students are much more likely to monitor their learning processes. So they can kind of figure out when they've actually learned something and therefore they need to stop you know, and can progress on to the next topic or when they need to come back and, and revisit something because they don't fully understand it or they have the complete grasp of the topic. So in terms of being able to monitor their strategies or their process, um, uh, sorry, um, um, if, if students are motivated, they're more likely to do those types of things. And that's, that's one of the reasons why they perform better. They are able to assess whether they've achieved things, they will persist more than students that aren't motivated, and... Um, and they obviously pay more attention. So um, we would have talked, to, we would have mentioned at the start some of the, or I would, I would have asked you some of the kind of factors which might motivate students. Um, in terms of lectures, we have this notion of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, and we can look at both of those. I'm going to talk a little bit about those in the next slide. Um, one of the interesting things is... Um, Self-belief and competence has a huge uh, significant uh, has a huge relationship to motivation as well. So, effectively, um, what the literature on, on kind of motivation would show is if, if we take two students who, in theory, have exactly the same ability. Okay, so let's say they've measured the performance, taken the same exams, and got the same results. Let's say on the leaving cert. You know, it's not necessarily a brilliant measure of ability, but let's just take it as a measure of ability. So, if two students have the same ability, if one of them believes that they can do better in a particular module, uh, all of the research results to date will suggest that they will do better. So, per, so, so, success at the end is not just about someone's ability; it's also about their self-belief, whether they believe they can do better or not. Um, and likewise, if students have doubts about their own ability, then they tend to underperform. They don't do as well as they could. So there's this, um, you know, uh, uh, effective attribute, not just about ability, but about their belief of, of self-worth and things like that, that, are, that, that impacts how well students do. And it's something that we need to be aware of, or, or something that we can be aware of when we are... Um, both when we're lecturing and when we're setting up assignments and stuff, that 
you know, it's useful to maybe think about this and think about how we can address this. Um, so um, self-belief and, 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 and beliefs about their competence has a big impact on actually how they perform. It's very hard. I mean, I think of a student last year who's qualification and not having self-belief. Hmm. It's very hard to ask them to think about their own self-belief. Well, you can say it, but nothing. Yeah. So one of the suggestions would be, and this is later on, but we might as well put it out there. One of the suggestions would be that early on in your module, you could have an assignment which is relatively low weight, but which everybody should be able to do well in. To get the ball rolling. rolling, So that they begin to see, look, this is a module where I can do well in, so that you're, you're challenging that belief that I can't do well in this module, or this module is really difficult and I won't be able to do well. Well, here, look, you have actually done really well. Okay, so that if you, you know, if you keep up this, and then it's about the patterns that we use, or that they need to, to use to do well, you know, that they need to study and they need to put in time and effort and those types of things, uh, and, and that you'll be able to repeat that performance. But um, lots of people, for lots of different reasons, would suggest that, um, particularly in first year, um, that the initial assignments should be less about, if you like, the academic standard and trying to hit that academic standard and more about trying to encourage belief in our students that, look, you can succeed if you put in a bit of time and effort. And I'm not saying that this, the assignment should be trivial, okay? You know, it should be challenging in some ways, but that everybody, you know, that does try on that course or that module should be able to succeed in it so that it's not about, you know, this is where we're aiming for really high standards. And but certainly in first year, the suggestion in lots of places is that... Um, Assignments and assessments do more to, uh, um, I guess, uh, support negative self-beliefs and therefore demotivate students and lots of dropouts and all that sort of thing because they're doing the wrong sorts of things. Maybe. Just a question. Uh, Absolutely. Hmm. Yes, I would agree with that. And what if you have something really simple, or a, uh, well, it's simple, but as you see, I have a lower value mm. in the very first assessment, but then the real assessment comes and the next one, mm. and then you'll really know, but that's not bring them down to a lower value uh, than if they had a continual, yeah. uh, a straight line rapid what we're supposed to achieve. Sure, there is a logic there, but the sort of argument is about those, the, this, the, the, the idea of putting in an assignment which is um, which most of the students should be able to do well is about challenging those students who have doubts about their ability, who have the ability to, to succeed in this module but don't think they have that ability. And it's about challenging those. Not necessarily that those students that don't have the ability should get through. I mean, they shouldn't necessarily get through. But if you have that ability but for some reason you don't have the confidence or don't think that you can, and that thinking is likely to have a very negative impact on your performance, then it's about how we can support those types of students rather than necessarily um, necessarily reduce the academic standard. And, and that would be the argument, too, for having relatively low weight, maybe 10 or 15% against that assignment, you know, so that it's not something that's likely to skew your overall results. So even if everybody does well, it's 10% out of the module. Do you know, so that... What you look to as well, I think, is that uh, when you know students have the ability, mm. but between part-time jobs yeah. and circumstances, they are not putting the time in. Yeah. So that's the killer. You know, that's yeah, and really yeah, and that's and that's a different issue because I think there's a gen, there's a real re, there's uh, not, not a real reason, but there's a different reason why they're underperforming there. It's not that they don't believe they can, it's just that they're not putting in the time. And, and I think they're they should you know, time. It's choice, yeah. Yes, it's a choice. Uh, it, it's a hard choice, and I do agree that, they're, that it's unfortunate on those particular students. But you know, that's I guess that's the way it works. 
And some of you would have mentioned this in terms of the third item there, which is the value associated with the learning task, that if we can um, stress the utility of what it is that we're teaching so that we can show that this has real value in some practical context, you know, or some whatever it might be, if we can em emphasize the importance of it, and if we can reduce in some ways the costs, the time and effort students need to put in to learn something, then all those things are going to positively impact on motivation. So if we can make, in our lectures, if we can make the learning process simpler by providing clearer explanations, by including loads of examples and those types of things, um, because students see it as being that bit easier to understand it, they're going to be more mo motivated, they're more inclined to put in the time and effort and those types of things. Whereas if they see or perceive that this is really difficult and they're not getting it and stuff like that, they're less motivated and stuff. So the value associated with the learning task, which is about how useful it's perceived to be, how important it is, and you know the, the costs associated with it um, are things that we know that motivate students. Um, kind of discussed this so that uh, I don't think there's any huge need to, to dwell on this in, in any great depth. Intrinsic motivation is all about, um, I guess, a desire to learn the subject for its own sake. And it's obviously what we would like our students to have, but uh, I would argue probably very few of them have it. And therefore, but, but the bonus is if we can motivate students through you know, that intrinsic thing to, to learn the subject for its own sake, it has a much longer impact than if we have exams or, or external well, things. I asked the third year, um, why are you here? Mm. And I asked the fourth year as well. And I was saying 95% say to pass the exams. Yeah. I said, are you here to learn anything? They said, no. No. We learned that at sea. Yeah. We're just compared to the exams. Yeah. Okay. Meanwhile, with a year ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd say that would be commonplace across, you know. Um, Past exams. Yeah. Across. They don't see the value of the. No, of the learning for its own sake. No. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we can try and emphasize and, and focus on. Um, and unfortunately, like again, what this, the literature would, would suggest is if we place too much emphasis on the other side of it, the external things, it, any students that do have that intrinsic motivation, it has a, a tendency to only because they don't see any value maybe associated with it, and they too then become motivated or focused on that, those external rewards. So it's something, you know, focusing on external factors, you know, when, particularly when we're lecturing, look, you need to concentrate on this because, you know, it's going to be on your assessment in next week or whatever it is. Um, well, it does get students' attention and it does work in the short term. It doesn't have long-term, there aren't long-term gains associated with that sort of um, motivation. Um, one of the most useful books I think that I've read on teaching is Ken Bain, who's a, a professor in Harvard and had a, wrote a book called What the Best College Teachers Do. Um, he spent 20 years researching various uh, um, instructors, in, predominantly in the U.S., um, to the extent that he would have gone in and sat on their classes and, and looked at their notes and all that sort of stuff. So it, it was a real kind of in-depth, I guess, look at what they did. And, and he was trying to basically look at these highly effective individuals and try and identify are there common characteristics, things that they all do in various ways that makes them really, really effective. Um, and some of the things, he did identify a number of common characteristics. And in terms of lectures, so this is a quote from him, they all begin with a question, which is sometimes embedded in a story, and continue with some attempt to help students to understand the significance of the question. His argument is that beginning with a question kind of taps into people's natural curiosity and therefore you're more likely to motivate you know, in, within a lecture. We're more likely to motivate our audience if we start by asking questions and posing questions and getting them to think for themselves about the, the issues. Uh, whereas the, if I jump on to the end of that quote, he talks about less successful lecturers um, who often focus on an answer to a question that nobody has ever raised. Uh, and therefore, students are often then thinking, well, like, what's the value, what's the purpose of you know, this 40-minute or hour-long kind of uh, uh, lecture on, on, on this particular topic? 
So, and again, lots of the literature in terms of lectures would suggest the same sort of thing to start with questions. The bigger, the more provocative the question, the more likely we are to engage students, the more likely we are to engage students, the more likely we are to motivate them in terms of the topic that we're dealing with. It's not an easy thing to do, to think of you know, really interesting questions to do with our topic, but if we can think about those, if we can frame those, um, we're likely to be very uh, much more, I guess, successful or, or, um, uh, uh, or motivating. Um, as Bill teaching um, the taught masters in CIT on teaching and learning, and one of the modules I teach is effective teaching practices. And in effective teaching practices, we ask participants to to do a short teaching session, like five minutes or something like that, and they get feedback on it. Uh, and one of the most engaging ones that, that I've um, been at started with this slide. And uh, we were asked to try and figure out what the topic was. And I thought it was really interesting, not just because, obviously, this, the graphic itself is very visual and, and kind of interesting, um, but the way that it then went on to frame the topic, which is about the relevance of this um, particular, these particular organisms and, and their impact on society and stuff. It was really interesting. It really worked well in terms of grabbing attention from the start, getting people you know, focused in on the topic and thinking about the topic and stuff like that. So um, again, questions, graphics, visuals at the start, a really powerful thing in terms of interest and motivation and stuff. And on, the, on your slide, there's a bit of text about what, what these guys actually are. Um, I mentioned about self-belief um, and, and the, the notion that at the start we might talk about tasks or, or to think about tasks that are useful. Um, uh, setting tasks, sorry, that are um, not so difficult that we're going to demotivate students uh, or, or at least that, that are going to challenge the perception that it's a really difficult topic. Um, as part of that, we can in class discuss the process of learning. Students often come and believe that their intelligence is fixed um, so that, you know, I can't do this because I'm not smart or something like that. Whereas the cognitive sort of um, science would suggest that intelligence isn't fixed, that, you know, we can all um, uh, improve, we can all learn, um, and it's about strategies and time and effort and doing those types of things. Um, and therefore, you know, there's value in you know, discussing this with students and communicating this to students that, you know, you can do well in this module, but it does require that you put in the time and effort and you study and you do these things. But, you know, there, there, there's no such thing as um, uh, sh the, the, the majority of students should be able to do well in this. And somebody else also put, talked about, I think it was you mentioned feedback at the start. And feedback, again, is something that's, that's been known to be really positive in terms of motivation, particularly if when we're giving feedback to students, we focus on some of the things that they've done well as opposed to just focusing on you know, the mistakes that they've made or the things that they've forgotten or whatever it might be. Um, uh, and and if, if we do that, that highlights what's been done well, uh, as well as critiquing the limitations, that is, that is important. We shouldn't, you know promote false self-belief, i.e., look, you've done a really, really, really super job when they haven't done a really super job, right? So, um, but it's about, you know, giving a realistic appraisal, but part of that should be, um, you know, promoting what has been done well in, in terms of the, um, the work. Um, the third sort of characteristic we talked about in terms of motivation is about adding value. It's about being some of the things we can do is to be clear and engage our audience. We talked about that in terms of the questions at the start or maybe the slides we might open with. Um, while we, as instructors, have probably thought about the content an awful lot and about the sequence of things and why we're looking or why we're delivering this particular topic, and that's very clear in our minds, it might not be at all clear to our students, you know, the, the value or the relevance of the particular topic. And, and taking some time out at the start to explain the relevance of the topic um, is, I think, really important. Um, so why should learners care about this as opposed, uh, without reference, ideally, to an exam or assessment? I have um, an acronym on the next slide. 
and it, it refers to, uh, again, Ken Bain's book, and, it, uh, and he talks about this particular Max lecture, who starts his course by handing, you know, the equivalent of an A4 sheet of paper out to his students with this written on it. Anyone have a guess what it might stand for? What? No, we close. Who gives a damn? Who gives a damn? Right. Possible. <coughs> Possible expert. Who gives a damn? So his, his promise to his students at the start of his course is that at any point in time in any one of his lectures, the student can raise this piece of paper and he's going to stop his lecture and explain why that topic is relevant. Now, it's a bit extreme, but it's going back to this topic that relevance. We have an easy answer here, though, you see, as opposed to the rest of CIT. Mm. The Department of Transport requires. Yeah, but uh, there must be, must, should be a reason why they require us as well. Then it might be more of a challenge, but I, I do think. <laughs> I, I, I'm not joking. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Have that. yeah. But that notion of relevance. Why is what we're doing relevant to their... Teach stuff that is no longer in existence. Yeah. And then, you know, you're not going to find students as engaged as... <laughs> uh, our lecturers. Our lecturers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, I speak for yourself. <laughs> 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 we're, we're right <laughs> You've been doing that for years and it's worked. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and liars. <laughs> Mm -hmm. What's in it for me? Me, yeah. And it's the same notion. It's about, you know, why, why, why do I have to listen to this and why is, is it of any, why should it be of any relevance to me? And I think it's something that we don't necessarily do a lot, any of us do a lot, you know, is, you know, we can get con very focused when we're planning things on the content and sequencing the content and, and trying to do that very effectively and stuff like that without maybe standing back and saying, does anyone really know why I'm doing this? And, and maybe spending less time on the content and more time on the why uh, may have a much bigger impact on, on our learners. I think linking with, with bigger themes, if that's possible, how it links to, let's say, uh, your learning outcomes for your module or maybe even bigger problems or themes within the discipline is a really useful thing. Um, and, and lots of people say to start with something that lecture, that learners might care about or know about or think they might know about is, is, a, is a useful starting point. So there's just, So to finish up on our right hand side what motivates students, we kind of, in terms of lecture, some of the things that we can address are intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and the value of the learning task. And I see um, the sort of strategies that we might use for both of those as being quite similar, which is the nature of questions, starting with kind of provocative or interesting questions to establish the relevance going to address both of those, linking to themes and learning outcomes and prior learning and, and you know, thinking about what the learners might care about will add or will ad could address either of those two things. In terms of self-belief, it's um, a bit about um, uh, opportunities for success, which, which is really maybe our first assignment or something like that. Um, and feedback and providing feedback which, reinf which encourages and, and, and um, supports, I guess, students. Our challenge is that belief that you are doing really well, you know, or you did do really well in this module, and if you continue in this line, you will continue to do really well, and, you know, and, and that sort of notion.